Hi, everyone. So uh, we're going to do, uh, we're Living Social. We um, build this consumer marketing platform. We, you go to livingsocial.com and it looks like it's a, just a deal site and it looks small and boring, but there's like actually a phenomenal amount of stuff under the waterline. We have, uh, most of our apps are written in Ruby and Rails, but we also have teams uh, working in Clojure, Scala, um, I almost said small talk, that would be a lie. Um, iOS, na like native iOS, native Android, big data stuff, uh, operations, uh, all sorts of stuff. So there's tons of interesting, weird, like big problems that we come upon. Uh, and we're gonna do uh, a few lightning talks on those technical things and then uh, also a few on um, how we operate as a distributed team and how um, we just operate as developers. Um, so the first uh, that's going to speak to you is Ed Wang. He's a, he's a graduate from our Hungry Academy training program where we pulled uh, basically just like 30 random people off the streets. Um, no, they, uh, they, it was not, we did not press gang them. Uh, we, they applied, we put them through, uh, it was nine weeks, not nine months, six right. months, six months. Nine, nine. <laughs> it was some number of months. It was six months. Uh, they did a, a really intensive training program, um, and, uh, are all really amazing developers. Um, and so he's a hungry, uh, Academy grad. He works on our, uh, mobile consumer, uh, apps. And uh, if you meet him later, ask him about his pen pal. So this is Ed. Hey guys. So, uh, so my name is Ed Wang, and what I'm going to talk to you today is about sharing templates in a service-oriented architecture. Cool. So if you've never been to our site before, if you go to livingsocial.com, this is the page that you land on. And to give you some context about our architecture, about two and a half, three years ago, we were still a monolithic Rails app, right? So everything was inside this one gigantic Rails app. Um, since then, we've been working very hard to kind of break things out into smaller microservices. So if you come to this page, uh, this is actually in an app that we call Browse, and Browse is responsible for surfacing the Browse experience to our customers. So uh, you can see some of the deals uh, on our site. Uh, if you click on, let's say, the Audible deal, you actually get taken to a page that looks like this. So uh, most of our users won't be able to tell, but they actually just left the Browse app, and now they're in an app that we call Sponsors. So Sponsors is responsible for surfacing deals that are sponsored. So this deal is sponsored by audible.com, hence it's free. Um, and let's say a user then decides to click on this tab up in the top, the Shop tab. They get taken to here. Uh, and this app, again, uh, is not the sponsors app anymore. It's an app that we call products and products is responsible for surfacing physical goods that we sell to our customers. So if we were to look back at the last three slides I just showed you, and I were to ask you, what is the one common thing that appears on all three slides? You might say it's the nav bar and you'd be correct. Um, one of the things that we've kind of discovered along the way of splitting things out into smaller services is things that might be very simple in a monolithic rails app can become quite complex uh, when you move towards a service-oriented architecture. So the big question that, that we're gonna ask ourselves today is, well, when it comes to sharing views, how exactly do we keep ourselves dry, right? So I don't need to tell you guys that, you know, out of the box, uh, in a monolithic Rails app, you have partials and layouts, right? So how might you show the nav bar on every single page? Well, you'll throw it into a partial called nav bar, and then you'll just go into your application layout, you'll render the nav bar, and then it just shows up everywhere, right? Um, this is great for a monolithic Rails app, but as soon as you move to a service-oriented architecture, it starts to break down. Well, why is that? The first thing is that it's a lot of copy and paste coding, right? So <clears throat> anytime you wanna make a change, you have to copy the nav bar into a bunch of different places. The second thing is that it requires changes in multiple places, and so it, it kind of slows your development down. Anytime you wanna make a tweak, uh, you have to go to 5, 10, 15 services and issue a pull request uh, so that uh, you know, the nav bar is updated in that specific application. What we've noticed is that things tend to get out of sync very quickly if you, if you take this approach. Um, so it leads to a bad kind of user experience in that the nav bar starts to change as you go from page to page. So this doesn't really work for us. 
The next thing that you might think of doing is, well, what about putting everything inside an engine or a gem, right? And this is a, a much better solution, right? Why is it much better? Well, the first thing is that it, it eliminates that copy and paste coding that we were just talking about, right? So everything is kind of stored in this single central repository. Uh, and, and then anytime you want to make a change, you just update the gem and kind of release it into the wild. One of the great things about putting this in an engine or a gem is that you can share more than just the markup, right? You can share translation files, you can share images, JavaScript, style sheets, et cetera, et cetera. So that's great. The problem with it, though, is that anytime you make an update, you still have to go to every single app and issue a bundle update. So, um, you know, it might work fine if you have a couple of apps. As soon as you move to 5, 10, 15 apps, it becomes a hassle. So this is not quite good enough. And at Living Social, we, we have a saying uh, that if services aren't solving all of your problems, you're probably not using enough services. So what did we do to solve our problem? Of course, we built another service, and the service we built is called Stepford. It was designed by a guy named Eric Brody, and Stepford is responsible for sharing our views across our service-oriented architecture. So when we were first building Stepford, we went through kind of a, a DDD approach, a, a dream-driven development approach, and we asked ourselves, what do we really want the interaction with a service to look like? And this is kind of what we came up with. So we have a client app. We wanted the client app to be able to ask Stepford and say, send me the footer, right? Stepford would then go off, do some stuff behind the scenes, and then just come back and say, here's your package. So let's kind of break that down into three separate steps. So the first step, send me the footer. We tried to come up with the simplest possible thing that we could think of, and that is just a get request to some JSON endpoint, right? So this is what the request looks like inside the Stepford app. It's a get request to, to the packages controller. And we just put the things that we want, so different elements uh, inside the query string. So here, we're requesting the footer. Uh, we can also pass additional variables, things like city ID, if we need that footer to be semi-personalized or, or modified. So now you're probably asking, well, what's inside a package, right? So a package is actually made up of three separate things, right? It's made up of markup, it's made up of styles, and it's made up of scripts. Um, and everything kind of revolves around the markup that, that you're requesting. So you might imagine that if you're requesting the footer, uh, there's an associated set of styles with it, an associated set of scripts with it. If the styles don't come through, then your footer looks really ugly. And if the scripts don't come through, then your footer probably isn't going to work the way that you want it to work. So, uh, so we kind of package all of the three things up because they all have to kind of come together and we put it in this concept of a package. Okay, so the next step. So the next step is Stepford gets that request and what does it do behind the scenes? So it's a little bit complicated and this is a, a very simplified high level version of it. But uh, in the top left corner, we see that the get request comes into that package's endpoint. Uh, Stepford then tries to make the package. So it grabs the markup, it grabs the styles, it grabs the scripts. It tries to pre-compile the styles, it pre-compiles the scripts, it throws everything into the database, and then it actually tries to render the markup on the server side. So that's super interesting. It takes the ERB template that is stored inside Stepford, and it actually renders it into raw HTML. It then sends it back via JSON. So that's the last step of the three-step process, the here's your package and I'm about to show you what a package response looks like. So the package response contains the three things that we talked about, right? The styles, the scripts, and the markup. And here you can see that all we requested was the footer, right? But you can imagine that in our, in our architecture, we're, an app generally requests more than just the footer. It probably requests the footer, it might request the nav bar, it might request button styles, et cetera, et cetera. And that is kind of all going to show up in that markup as raw HTML. Uh, and the nice thing is that Stepford will kind of package together all of the styles and all of the scripts for every single markup element that you've requested. So everything just kind of boils down into one pre-compiled style sheet and one pre-compiled JavaScript. Cool. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about the pros and cons of spinning up a service like Stepford. Uh, the obvious biggest pro is that you keep your views dry, right? Uh, I don't need to tell you the benefit of, uh, of having all of your views in a, in a single central repository, right? There's huge benefits, it's easy to maintain, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, the second thing is that it's super easy to release changes. So Stepford is all pull through, which means that anytime you update a nav bar or anytime you update the footer, you don't have to go to every single app and tell them there's a new nav bar, there's a new footer. The next request that it makes to Stepford, it's actually going to, Stepford is actually going to send back the latest version of whatever element there is on the, on the, uh, in the database. Okay, so there's obviously some cons. The first con is that it's another service. So one thing that we've realized by spinning up so many services at Living Social is that anytime you make a service, you're trading application complexity for network complexity, right? So that means that your tech ops team has to maintain one more application. They have to make sure that it's up all the time. Otherwise, you know, your styles won't come through. The next thing is that because it's another service, it also means that there's another network request going on. So Stepford does introduce some amount of latency into your application, right? There's another HTTP request that goes on on the server side. At Living Social, the way that we kind of have gotten around that is we've put in a lot of, a lot of caching, right? So we have varnish caching around uh, Stepford. We also have mem cache around it. The reason is, is because uh, a lot of times our main UI elements don't change all that frequently. And so it's okay to put things like varnish in front of it. It's okay to put memcache in front of it. And the last thing is that changes have a much larger impact. So when I said it's easy to release changes, sometimes it's too easy to release changes. Uh, you know, there have been instances where we'll make a change in JavaScript and we, quite, we can't quite anticipate what the effects downstream will exactly be. Um, and so, as such, you really need very close JavaScript monitoring to make sure that you understand when errors come through. Uh, so that's it. Uh, that's my talk on Stepford. If you have any questions, uh, please come find me after the talk and uh, we will chat. Thanks, Ed. So the, these guys get to watch me use a computer. Just great fun over my shoulder. This is Tyler. Tyler works also on our consumer apps team. He's from uh, Southern California, which is his handsome looks. Northern California. Nor <laughs> I botched it, sorry. Uh, but still handsome, but he's taken, ladies. Uh, and I just learned from his website that he wants to learn everything, so if you see him in the hall, just literally tell him anything, and it will be the best part of his day. Howdy. I'm Tyler. Uh, I live in Northern California. I work remote. Um, so, how do you work a computer? Okay, let's, let's start at the beginning. It's a good place to start. All right, ready and play. All right, so I'm gonna talk about um, internal gem infrastructure, basically making it easy to write gems, release gems. Um, for us, you know, sharing is caring. Being able to share code effectively across your apps uh, makes things really awesome. It's, it's easy, like we said, to extract things in the services, break down the monolith, when you can share code and you can put it into a gem really easily. Um, it reduces the copy-paste mayhem. Uh, we've had, you know, we put up a little service and someone writes a little client that gets copy-pasted 50 places and then we make changes. It's really hard to track down who's hitting what endpoints. So we've had to go back, put those things into a gem so we can share and keep things maintainable. Um, building gems and having this, you know, code in gems uh, really helps build this culture of internal open source. A gem gets its own repo, it gets its own readme. It's really easy for anyone to contribute to it and people know where things are. Uh, you get all the benefits of pull requests. Help rates, it helps with separating concerns. Like we're told like, hey, you should make a mess, you know, um, but where do you put that mess in a Rails app? It's kind of weird. Like, where do I put all these little tiny objects with single responsibilities? Where do they live? How do I keep track of it? And putting the stuff in a gem is really nice. It helps you draw boundaries around your code, define your domain better. Um, isolating your code is, is actually really great for deleting it later. Um, it's, you can track it down, you can find where it needs to go and get rid of it, but you don't necessarily have to delete the code. You don't have to go, where was that one commit that one time where I did that one thing and I gotta go look through all these old commits. You just go look at the repo, but you've deleted all that code out of the other code bases. You still have some of that history around. Um, isolating is good too because it forces you in how does your code interact with Rails? How do you interact with the database? How do you do logging? when you're isolated in your own little gem. Do you even need Rails for this little business project that you're working on? Does it need to be part of a Rails app? Um, this has really helped me like, try to constrain my code to the simplest form it needs to be to get the job done. This helps me mock and stub boundaries in my tests. 
because uh, it's clearly defined where it needs to interact with other pieces of our, of our architecture. Um, this has really helped me with writing good docs because I have a readme for this thing. It's really easy. Um, so a real example, a few weeks ago I was tasked with automating a daily CSV report out of the database and uploading it to a third party's FTP site. They then will return us a plain text email telling us the results of processing this data. A coworker commented, 1997 wants its architecture back. Um, so we've all done this. We say, hey, man, I'm just going to drop this in the model, you know. This FTP code CSV, it uploads, gets the job done, you know. Fat models, bro. Um, and a couple weeks later, you're like, what is, what is this code? Who put this here? What does this even do? Or a year later, two years later, who, who did this? And so, you know, I was thinking, this is really gnarly code. It has just, it has a kind of a single responsibility. It has just one thing it needs to do. So I'll make a gem. So um, the rest of my talk, um, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, building gems, releasing gems, and then hosting your own gems uh, internally. Um, so building a gem, this is another crash course inside a crash course. This might be review for some of you, but um, this is just kind of the easy way that I see how to do it. Um, so it's, a, it's another crash course. So, um, so building a new gem is this easy. You already have this installed. You already have Bundler installed. You just type bundle gem, your gem name. Um, the LS on the front there, that's to help us with namespacing. I'll get into that in a second, but Bundler will do that for you. Um, this is what it creates. This is your basic fresh gem. It's the gem file, a license, which is MIT. Uh, you get your readme, like I said, you get a rake file, and then you get your lib directory with all your program code in there. Um, the most important file there is at the bottom, that's the gem spec. Without that, you don't have a gem. There's plenty of documentation on you know, what goes in a gem spec, uh, but Bundle does a good job of doing defaults for you. Um, namespacing, if you hadn't seen this before, um, I've done this at a couple different companies, and it's really helpful. You basically take your company name, shorten it down to two letters, and you put it in a module, and you put all your classes under this global kind of module. Um, that's how you use it there. It's ls for this one, a gem in a box client, and you require it. If you've seen that, like, you know, ls slash thing, that's how it's, that's how you're doing namespacing. This is really helpful. Um, we have some early gems that didn't do this, and I wasn't sure when I first started, is this an open source implementation, or is this internal? Like, where did this thing come from? So maintaining this namespace is, is, is helpful in uh, knowing where your code has come from and that it's an internal project. Um, so basic example, this is just, just kind of uh, an example that has a few more things in it. We threw a changes file in there so we know what happens when the version changes. Um, and then we got our, you know, some more program code and we have our own tests. Like everything is nicely, tightly compacted for, for this little project. Um, a quick review on semantic versioning. You can go to semver.org. Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Um, some people don't understand it, so I want to review it. Um, the last number in a version number is the bug fix number. You increment this when things change, like when you fix bugs, but you haven't broken the public API. You haven't changed. You haven't broken anything. Um, the minor version number is when you added a new feature. Yay, we have new stuff, but you haven't removed anything. You haven't, you haven't broken the public API. You haven't forced people into changing things. And then finally, the major version number is you broke something. You have changed significant amounts of things, and people beware. Like, this might break your code. Um, and you can think of this like how hard it is to upgrade from Rails 2 to 3 or from Rails 3 to 4. That's a big change, so that is a major version number. If it's stable, it should be 1.0. If it's not stable, it should not be 1.0. Um, this is a good signifier. It just says, hey, this has been used in production. It's stable. It's, everyone can use this when you go to 1.0. Um, if it's before that, you've probably seen gems that are 00, 1237. And it's like, I'm not sure if I should use this. That's a lot of version numbers. Um, so that's just a quick refresher on building gems and versioning namespacing. Um, now we need to let the world behold your awesomeness, or at least the people at your company. Um, releasing should be easy. We say deploying should be easy. Deploying and releasing gems should be an easy thing. This is not easy. Remembering the version number and tagging it and rake build and like, this is not easy. This is easy, rake release. This is really easy. Um, when you use Bundler, you get this rake command for free. But don't accidentally open source your code. Uh, this happens, and there are bots that mirror Ruby gems right away. Um, it's very hard to take that back. So how do you go from this to this, but keeping everything internal? Um, you can monkey patch, I mean subclass bundler. Um, gem in a box will actually tell you on their wiki page to, to monkey patch bundler. Don't do that. Um, so what we can do, we re rewrote our own gem um, that just inherits from bundler's gem helper. Um, there's tutorials on this, but 
I'm just going to go through real quick how this works. In your, in your rake file, you see this bundler gem tasks at the top. What that actually does is that gives you those three default rake tasks, the build, the install, and the release. Um, by default, it's going to push it to Ruby gems, and we don't want that. Um, so when we subclass it, what we want to do is we want to say, we use gem in a box as our gem server at Living Social. Um, we want to say, hey, don't push to Ruby gems, push to gem in a box. So we subclass bundler and said, hey, don't push to Ruby gems. If you try to, if you even try to call the private, the protected method there, you're going to get an error. Um, so just don't do it. And then once we release that gem, it's just a really small gem, we put LS gem tasks in place of bundler gem tasks in all of our other gems. So by default, this goes to our gem server when you release. It's really easy. Um, so gem servers, you, you know how to build one, you know how to get it out there, now you need some place to put it. Um, there are three options. There's gem in a box, uh, stickler, and then gem fury. Um, so if you're hosting your own, it should be behind the firewall. It's internal code. You don't want anyone else accessing it. Um, Gem in a box provides a nice web interface for managing your code. It has authentication. You have to build your own rack middleware to do the authentication. Um, it does pull through mirroring, which is kind of cool. You can tell it to uh, mirror everything from Ruby gems as you install things. So you don't need to depend on Ruby gems being up uh, when you deploy. Uh, Gem in a box will pull down everything for you. Um, and it has a nice command line client. It's pretty simple. Uh, it patches gem with this in a box command and allows you to push and set up your own uh, machine to talk to your server. Um, the other option for open source thing, uh, gem servers is Stickler. Uh, it provides authentication in the same kind of way. It does selective mirroring, so you can tell it, you know, mirror active record 3.2, um, and it'll pull it from Ruby gems. You can also give it a whole gem, fi gem file lock, um, and it'll take everything in there and it'll mirror all of it for you, um, which is handy. Um, it has a really full featured command line client. You can do everything that you can do from their web interface. Um, and then it's the author wanted me to note that it's going to support the bundler dependency API um, in the next release it's coming soon. Um, for a hosted server that's not behind the firewall, it's on someone else's machine, there's only one option I know about. Um, it's gemfury.com. They provide authentication, obviously, because it's not on your machine. Um, they don't appear to do mirroring, which is, you know, if you're still relying on someone else's service, you're going to probably be relying on Ruby gems too, so they don't do mirroring. They have a command line client, and then they do support Node.js and Python packages. So uh, that's it. My name is Tyler Montgomery, and I'm Uber Majestics on Twitter. Thank you, Tyler. Next up, we have Dan Mayer. He's also on our consumer app team. Not everyone is on the consumer app team. Uh, he does a lot of uh, teaching in the DC area, teaching people Ruby. Um, and I just learned that he can fix bugs from ski lifts. Uh, over the phone, so that is a useful parlor trick. And, uh, take it away, Dan. All right. Uh, hello. I'm going to be talking to you about production code analysis. Obviously, as you build up all these services and split out all your code, it gets much harder to debug and start finding out things about your code. Like a small application is easy to reason about in your head, uh, but as your systems grow and your architecture grows, it gets more difficult. Oh. Could somebody fix the projector and get us all on? Uh, shrink down. Is that one on, or is that off as well? Well, if somebody could fix that one too, that'd be great. Um, you can't improve if you can't measure. Um, you can't improve what you don't know. Uh, we often focus on performance and exception monitoring. Um, some fixate on test code coverage. There's a lot to learn from what your code actually does in production. Um, Ruby tools aren't quite as good as like the Java tools, so we really are still trying as a community to improve those tools, so that's some things we're working on internally. Um, and then uh, I want to mention Etsy. Uh, they have some great posts all about measuring production systems, graphing everything, and actually uh, release stats D, which we rely on quite heavily. So I wanted to just say thanks for that. All right, so I like to focus as we split things out and kind of forked off code bases on getting rid of unnecessary code because I want to be able to only think about and reason about the code that we actually care about and what's actually being used in a system. Um, dead code ends up in production for a whole lot of reasons. I've listed up a whole bunch there, but we don't really need to go through every one. If you've ever worked on a team and as it grows, you eventually find code that you're like, this was written three years ago and nobody's using it. Why is it here? Um, I think it's important to try to track that down and get rid of it as soon as possible, especially as you're adding a lot of code very quickly to systems. 
Um, so there's various ways to find dead code. Some's as simple as just using New Relic or formerly Trace Linux. You can do custom stats and in instrumentation, which I'm going to going to talk about a little bit. Uh, there's production code coverage. Uh, there's a gem I've been working on that does code coverage, but not on your test suite. It's actually live code running in your system. And after uh, seeing some of the talks by uh, Tilda, I also realized I can make it much more performant in Ruby 2.1.1, so I'll be working on doing that, because right now there's a, a high cost, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, you can use logs. You should definitely have your logs all searchable, and we'll go into that. Uh, using stats in instrumentation and production code coverage, we've deleted 20 plus thousand lines of app code, and then hundreds of thousands of lines of code if you start including our assets, our JavaScript, um, test files, and that sort of thing. We've really been able to shrink down our code bases as we expand out. So third party, real quick, if you use New Relic, you can go to the transactions, go look at the last seven days, Sort by count, the things at the bottom likely are dead, deprecated, or you can start working on killing them. They have like one request in the last seven days, you might wanna go look at what those are. It's really easy, but still useful. If you're ever finding an endpoint and you wonder, wait a minute, what is this? Go check, it might not be hit in the last seven days. You can probably kill it. It's real easy. Um, it's actually even easier because we have a gem, New Rel Relic Route Check, which basically you can download the CSV from New Relic this generates your Rails route file and then compares your routes versus the output of New Relic and then starts telling you this was in your routes file but never actually hit. You can go look at those endpoints. Uh, stats instrumentation, we're gonna step through all of these uh, fairly quickly, uh, but basically there's a lot of different things you can do with stats to help you find code and tell what's going on in your systems. So background events, you want to know which jobs are being executed, you want to know if they're completing successfully, you might want to know how long they take. This is an example for rescue, uh, we actually have our own wrapper around most of our background jobs so we do it at a different layer. Stats D, before perform, after perform, you can throw in whatever else you want there if you want timers, anything. But it's really easy to instrument that, then you have your nice graphite graphs where you can kind of follow and see the See the charts on everything. You can also look at Graphite and see if a job's no longer ever being performed. Emails, email templates, especially transaction emails. Eventually, you have a one-off transactional email for some holiday thing, some special uh, product, something that's no longer being triggered. You can check all your emails. It's no, no reason to work on updating them or fixing them, especially when you're doing, say, a Rails update and you have to change all your action mailer code. This will let you know if it's worth your time. <coughs> Views rendered. Uh, eventually your view layer will get very complicated with layers and layers of partials. If you have layers and laser layers of partials, it's hard to reason about which ones are still in use, which ones have been refactored away entirely. You can actually really quickly, using active support notifications, find all your layouts and all your partials and templates and track them. This is an example showing it to StatsD, or you can just render it into your Rails logger and then you can search it in something like Splunk Elasticsearch, see if it exists. Again, we made a gem for this to make it easier. Uh, you can see Flatfoot. Basically, you set up Flatfoot, it does this uh, for you, and then it gives you some helpers to find used views, unused views. Uh, you can reset it on each deploy. It makes it really easy to kind of automate this process and generate reports on it. Uh, one-off trackers. Sometimes you just find some code and you're not quite sure what's going on. Uh, it's very easy with StatsD to just throw on one-off trackers. This is an example of a controller. We're trying to figure out which of the types or, or paths in the controller are still being hit. You can go ahead and throw increment on each of the formats on that request.xhr. Now you're going to be able to say, oh, actually we stopped using the you know, JSON format months ago. Let's get rid of all the related code. Uh, production performance comparisons. Uh, this one I owe thanks to Uber, <laughs> Uber Majestic over here, Tyler. Um, he actually just threw this out and didn't really make any fanfare of it on one of our applications. And I saw this and I was like, that's really cool. We had two different options for stripping out some um, <coughs> HTML. 
and we want to know what's faster. You could benchmark it locally on some fake data, but the production data is very different than what you're going to test with, and it, it, it will vary a whole lot over all our applications. He threw this in there, splits it 50%, throws the timer around it, measures both one implementation of the algorithm versus the other. A couple days later, it's incredibly obvious that Nokugiri is much faster than just using the regular strip tags from Rails. Um, and that, that I, th I just thought was so interesting that I've kind of been carrying around to point out to everybody I can find that's interested. Uh, translation usage, uh, this one I owe uh, Chris Morris some credit. He's another engineer at Living Social. Uh, he works a lot on our payment systems, but he used to do a lot of our translation and internationalization work. And eventually your translation files get really large and they actually take up a lot of memory in your running Ruby processes. So if you're trying to shrink down your memory so you can fit, fit more workers on a box, you might want to look at your translation files. They tend to be uh, a pain point for a lot of companies that have a lot of languages. Uh, this lets us track which keys are actually being used. What are we still translating in production? Or what is it we no longer are using the translation for? As you delete all these views, it's easy to forget about all the translations that were in the views. This actually makes it very simple to go and find those. Uh, production code coverage. This is a little bit more experimental at the moment. Uh, we do run it on production. I have it on a lot of systems. Uh, I cannot use... Um, Coverage, which is what like simple cov and things use in your test suite, because there's a bug in Ruby. If you sample and turn it on and off, it will crash, uh, which luckily I learned prior to production. Um, so I switched to using set trace func, and this lets us see each line as it's being run uh, live. And then we do sampling to cover the fact that set trace func is extremely slow, uh, sometimes 400, 800 percent slower. Uh, so we can sample a very small rate of request, but it still will over a whole lot of volume give you a pretty good idea of what's used in production. And like I said, in 2.1.1, I just learned that you can actually get the CPU um, profiler, is a sampling profiler, and you can get the line number data out of it with a very small uh, C extension. So I'll probably be updating this, and that will only help 2.1.1. It'll still have to use set trace funk on 1.9.3 and 2.0.0. Uh, but you can get some really interesting data and delete a lot of code this way. Um, here's a quick example of the setup, but really go to the GEMS homepage. You can see you can do ignores on things. It'll check your app path. It tracks in Redis. Uh, I use a startup delay because Rails is very slow on the first few requests because it actually builds a lot of code in memory at that time, and you really don't want to be uh, checking your code coverage as it's building new methods. It's just not a good use of CPU. Um, yeah, and this shows how to set it up in your rake file. And uh, real quick, I'll, I'll, I was going to have a demo. I think I missed the slide, but we're, we've got other speakers, so I'm going to skip ahead real quick. On logs, I just want to mention, make sure to get all your logs from all your applications in one place. Elasticsearch, Splunk, Kibana, uh, doesn't really matter. You just want everything in one place so you can actually see how requests are going across your system. I've been working on a gem uh, called Imprint. But also you can look at uh, Zipkin, which is, uh, I guess, some of like Twitter's work. Um, mostly they do Scala, but I guess they have stuff for Ruby as well. I just learned about that at this conference. But basically, if you put a trace ID on your requests, you can see as they're coming in your system. And then as you make multiple API requests to your backend, you can see how that fanned out in your system. You can also drop it to all your events. So any event that fails, you can track it to the incoming request. If you have an exception, it's going to be in the headers. It'll be on your exception. You can actually take the exception and go see all the logs for all the, the requests and debug what was coming in that was so awkward to cause this exception. And I think all these tools can help you clean up your code and actually understand what's happening in production much better. And that's all I've got. Thanks, Dan. Um... Are you going next, or is Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm telling Rodrigo to sit down. Yeah. Nick, Nick is going to go next. Uh, Nick is a, a Minnesotan. He's on our Mail Tools team, a JRuby contributor. He, and if you're wondering, he's six foot four inches tall and can help you get things off of tall shelves. Uh, and he's going to talk to us a little about meditation. Je pense donc je suis. 
which is French for I think, therefore I am, of course, by the famous philosopher René Descartes. I'd like to ask to ponder today a little bit about whether that's really an appropriate frame of mind. Um, you can interpret that statement to mean that we identify ourselves, our entire existence, by the fact that we can think. Um, and I personally think that's a really bad idea. Um, early in my career, um, I was obsessed with my capacity to get work done. I wanted to work all the time. Um, and I was constantly searching for that sort of state of, that elusive state of flow. Um, but in fact, what I think I really got stuck in most often was a, an off more common state of yak shave. Um, so when you think of yourself during the work day, uh, you know, how often do you find yourself getting distracted, um, running down a rat hole, uh, and then once you get done with that whole that whole rat, once you finally unwind the stack and get all the way out of that rat hole, how many times do you find you're saying, wow, that felt great? It's like, no, it probably did not. And uh, I'm arguing that one of the reasons why it doesn't feel great is because we all too often let our minds run wild. Uh, we take every thought that comes into our head and we believe it's the truth or we believe there's some element of truth to it. Um, we might even have perceptions about ourselves and the way other people perceive ourselves and we think that some, for some reason those are true. And I'm here to tell you that they're not. Um, I think that um, we have, all of us inside us, we have a sort of a silent watcher, observer of our lives that's behind all the thoughts. And um, if we can all take a little bit of time in our day to access that part of ourselves, we find that we're going to be happier, uh, we're going to be uh, healthier. And um, that's kind of a, a little bit of what I want to outline today. So. As far as meditation goes, in terms of a discussion for today, I'm going to say that meditation is sort of spending some quiet time, you know, attempting to find sort of an absence of thought in your head. And if you've ever tried meditation, you know that this is actually extremely hard. Um, people have been meditating for thousands and thousands of years, and it is most certainly a lifelong practice. Um, and when you realize how hard it is to think, oh my gosh, how am I going to actually, will I ever get to a state where I feel comfortable with this? Is this something I, that's really worthwhile to do? Um, and I would advise up front that meditation, like many other things in our lives that we find worthwhile to do, all it requires is just a little bit of time and making it a habit to get the most out of it. So don't make, don't, don't listen to the voices in your head again. Don't listen to your thoughts that are saying, oh my gosh, I have no time to do this. Um, I, I'm not going to do this right. I don't know how to do this. It's not going to be perfect. So therefore, I'm not going to try. Just ignore all those and just try, try to do it. Uh, there are a number of studies out there. Meditation does have actual tangible scientific health benefits. Uh, there is a one study um, that had people meditate for 30 minutes a day for eight weeks. And they did brain scans on the people before and after and found that their gray matter in brain regions associated with memory and stress and empathy actually increased in just eight weeks. So you can actually, you know, even as an adult, um, you know, we're long past puberty. Even as an adult, you can spend time and change the composition of your mind and the composition of your body. Uh, another uh, study at UC Davis um, folks, uh, found that focusing on the present, uh, doing thing, activities like meditation, um, rather than letting the mind run away or drift, uh, actually lowered levels of the stress hormone cortisol in your body. So. Meditation also will allow you to get on top of your um, your hormones and get, get a better hormonal balance. You'll feel a lot better about yourself. So um, unfortunately, a lightning talk is probably a bad place to actually try to try to lead a meditation session since I think you, to do it justice, you'd want to probably have at least a five minute quiet time to yourself. But instead, what I want to do is take just a few moments and actually ask all of you to um, um, uh, you don't have to do this yet, but what I'm, what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute here is close your eyes and just try to get comfortable and try to clear, clear your mind of any thoughts. Um, and then what I'm going to ask you to do is to just spend some time trying to attain that, that, that clear head and watch your mind for the very next thought that comes out. And watch your mind like a cat would watch a mouse hole. So I'm going to ask you all now to close your eyes and watch your mind and just try to watch for the very next thought that comes in. And just try to be focused and attentive. Don't try to follow, don't try to lull yourself to sleep or anything. Just, just be focused and attentive and try to look for that very next thought. And I'll just give you a few moments.
And when that thought comes in, go ahead and open your eyes. Okay, some of you actually la la lasted quite a while there. That's pretty good. So what you might be finding with this little exercise is that when you take the time to be really attentive about having a clear mind, um, it actually takes a little while longer for that thought to come in. Um, so this is, this is actually the very beginning of a meditation practice. You're actually trying to, rather than being completely, uh, completely uh, lifeless or, or almost like a, um, well, you're actually trying to be very, very attentive to the, very, you know, to the immediate present moment. Um, so when you're doing this, it's important to not be self-critical, right? So maybe a thought rushed in right away again, and you feel like, oh gosh, I have no control of it. Well, don't try to control what's happening. Don't try to be on top of it. We, you know, we're all control freaks a lot. We're in technology. We like things to work. We like to control computers. Don't try to be in control of the situation. Just observe where your thoughts are jumping to, um, and just, just try to be that passive observer of what's happening in your mind. Um, and then, so once you start to get in this habit of taking time to at least check in with yourself, maybe you start a meditation practice, or maybe you uh, just want to take moments out of your day to just take a break from things and be a little bit more mindful, a little more self-aware. Um, ask yourself throughout the day, am I at ease at this moment? You know, ask yourself, how do you, you know, how do I feel at this moment? Am I at ease? Or what's going on inside of me? And just, just pay attention to those feelings and those, what's going on inside you without judging or, or trying to make any changes about it. We're just trying to cultivate self-awareness here. Um, I also find that doing meditation has led me to doing other things really mindfully as well. I, I like to do, I like to cook, um, I like to clean, I like to do all these little kind of um, tasks that don't require a huge amount of mental energy. And I like just focusing on them intently. And I find that even doing same things like chopping vegetables or or clean or doing dishes or any, any tasks which you think normally would be completely, you know, oh, what a waste of time. I don't want to do this right now. I really don't want to do these chores. You can actually find a little bit of pleasure in just focusing completely on the task. And that's another way to just kind of open yourself up and be, be more at ease. Um, and, you know, of course, we all have screens on us at all, all times of the day these days. And that's another area where it's like looking at a screen, you're putting your attention out into the either out somewhere else from where you are right now so when you're with someone even when you're by yourself maybe every now and then put the screen down and just focus on on just what you're doing um, and I think for me my my opinion of, of the you know this this lifelong process of trying to be more mindful trying to meditate trying to make uh, make ourselves better through meditation is actually a, a contagious thing and one that we can contribute to the well-being of the entire planet. So I hope you will consider, uh, you know, reducing the crazy noise in your mind and uh, maybe check out what meditation can do for you and kind of follow up on some of those studies I, I mentioned. I will have, uh, I'll tweet a link later on. I, I, was, I was planning on posting it before this talk, but I forgot to do it. I have to get back to my computer, but I will, I will tweet a link later. My, my Twitter handle is um, Nick Seeger, N-I-C-K-S-I-E-G-E-R, and I'll tweet a link later with some of the, the articles and, and links to things that I, I, looked, I ref referred to during the course of my talk. So uh, meditate, be happy, make the world better. Thanks. Now's your time, Rodrigo. So, uh, Rodrigo is a, a developer on our merchant team, and uh, he's an avid gamer, both board and video, right? Yes. And uh, you're from Brazil, right? Yes. Definitely south of the equator. Yes. And um, if you see him in the hall, ask him about his goats. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna see them. All right. A couple of them. Oh yeah. Take it away. Thank you. It's hard. You're strong. Right. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Rodrigo, and uh, I'm here to give you one trick to boost your productivity when working from home. Uh, my Twitter handle is Cafo. Even my wife calls me that, so you, you can call me that too, or Rodrigo, whatever you want. Uh, I wrote an article for our tech blog about uh, how uh, I do work from home and uh, how I try to focus on things while you're doing that. And uh, the most important thing that people talked about was the pet goats. Uh, 
uh, that they were in the article, like briefly. I'm gonna show you some. Here's me with my pet goat in a hangout for work. If you want to read the article, it's available here. It's a tiny link. And uh, I have been working remotely f uh, from home for about 10 years. So I had to find my way to focus on stuff. Otherwise, I would just play video games all the time. And uh, that's why we have this unrelated cat picture. And uh, this article name is one weird trick because while I was browsing the internet without ad block, I saw a lot of these, uh, these like ads like, one tip for a flat belly. And like Gigi said, like there's no way we can have like a quick fat be flat belly. So what, what would be like this one trick that you can get to have focus? And I think it's boundaries. Like uh, I had a couple things I do that limit my work day and my personal day because at home they are very together. And I'm just gonna briefly show you some of these things. Like, every day I start my day with a startup ritual. I get presentable because we do hangouts and I need to be properly dressed, not undressed, whatever. And then uh, I do what I call, I, I open the cafeteria. I get like some fizzy water done. I put coffee in the air press, I grind the beans, and then I have a very good cup of coffee. Uh, the other thing that I think it's important, after all of that done, I get my cup of coffee, I sit down, I start working, and I think you, re you really need to eliminate distractions. You need to find a way to be in your mind office while in your home. And what I found out that was very good for me was having a good pair of headphones. The headphones are nice because they allow you to focus on stuff, and uh, like people around you, like my wife knows when I'm with the head headphones, she can talk to me. The dog don't care about uh, a lot about it, and the pet goat just gets sad because <laughs> he can't get my attention. And I also have all sorts of gizmos, like I plug the headphones there so I can have even more like uh, better sound. And that way, my wife just like needs to throw stuff at me, like wake up, get out of here, need something. And I call that uh, my focus flag. It's like a way I can show to the world and to myself that it's time to work, I'm not here. I may, he I may be here in my body, but my mind is doing other things for my company. So, uh, okay, you got there, you had your startup ritual, you got your computer, your headset, goats away, so you can really start working. And then you're done because you do a lot of multitasking and you can do that. Like uh, why we spend all the time in Hacker News on Reddit? Because the w it's way more fun than do work. Like you have that li huge list of things to do, but you want to be on Reddit. So you need to cut down multitasking. You need to find ways to not change what you are doing. So if you're coding, you're coding. You don't have like... If Gmail is low, you should not open a new browser tab but with, oh, just gonna browse a second, your day is gone. So what I done, for example, I had these, these uh, tiny Arduino plugged in on my computer, so if someone sent me an IM message and they are in a whitelist, I would get a light that says you need to answer them because it's your boss or someone from your team. If it's not, like you can answer whatever you have time. So you need to find ways to not multitask. Another important thing is don't work all the time. When I started working remotely, I said like, uh, yeah, I need to make sure I don't play video games all the time. And I started wor working all the time and I would never stop. So you need to find a good balance between one thing and the other. You should also spend time with others. Like don't spend all the time at a computer, like uh, just working mindless. Like, find time to spend time with other people and also find time to learn new stuff, like challenge yourself in Cold Wars, do some Khan Academy stuff. Like, you need to have a good balance in your life to make sure your work is, works well and everything goes fine. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much.